what's going on in here. Yeah. Um, okay then, so I think um, is everyone back who's coming back? Maybe a few people. Back. Right. Um, so the um, the the article that I asked you to really try and get through is, was written by Stella Sanford. But she has a very good take on Heidegger. Um, and we'll have a look at that, at some of the, the main points that she raises. Now, I think that her article was inspired by annoyance at this book, which is a book that's called Heidegger's Hidden Sources uh, by a guy called Reinhard May. And the argument of the book was that... So, you know these binaries we've been talking about? East and West. Well, one of the problems um, of saying there's Western philosophy and Eastern thought, right? It's never, it's never Eastern philosophy. Sometimes it is. But the binary has gone Western philosophy, Eastern thought. And the reason it's called Eastern thought is because people have said it doesn't really fit into Western categories. And one of the things that um, Stella Sanford points out is that the very notion of philosophy has been an ever, like uh, Western philosophy, has been an, uh, a kind of ongoing narrowing of that concept, the professionalising of the concept of philosophy, that excludes everything else from it, that doesn't quite fit into its disciplinary frames. So, it's all right. Um, one of the one of the first points that, but she actually makes it last. She makes it towards the end of the article. Is that the very binary again? So here's the trick. Here's the thing. Look for the binary, and think: Is that a binary? There's always a binary. Somewhere. Even when people say there isn't a binary, there's, there's probably a binary. Um, as soon as you go Western philosophy, East Asian thought. You've said that it's that's not philosophy. What what's the history of that distinction? Stella Sanford says the history of that distinction is one that was invented by uh, Western thinkers who kind of didn't want to bother with that too much and drew a line when that's not going to deal with that. But what people have noticed over the decades is that Western philosophical styles um, really struggled with the concept of being. I'll say a little bit about being. Capital B being. What is being? And that Heidegger's approach was actually similar to kind of Taoist thinking and Buddhist thinking. In that Heidegger talks about the way, this way, that way, the way of this, the way of that, the way of the West, the way. Which And, and, and way is a translation of Tao, which means, well, does it mean the way, right? It's the way of things, the way of the world, the way of the universe, right? The way of time. So Heidegger talked a lot about this, so people have kind of gone, oh, that's a bit like that. Heidegger's a bit like Chinese philosophy. And then they've written books like this, going, it's amazing. And Reinhard May argues that, essentially, Heidegger nicked all of his best ideas from East Asian philosophy and then tried to cover it over. And Stella Sanford says, no, it doesn't. It's more complicated than that. It doesn't do that. Heidegger, Heidegger's relationship with Japan was well known, and I mentioned this uh, earlier on in the module. The Japanese loved Heidegger. He was translated into Japanese. He had loads of guests, hence Count Kuki apparently turned up, and all the rest of it. And she says there's more going on than this. It's not as simple as that. It's, there's more going on than Heidegger's philosophy looking a bit like ancient Chinese or ancient Indian thought. Um, and she just points out basic facts like the most influential reception of Heidegger's work fed into the philosophical justification of fascism in Japan. Heidegger's approach led to people, um, you know, it was part of the intellectual apparatus of fascism. I mentioned last week the Nihon Jinron, this Japanese style of um, of, of talking about itself as if it's different. That long historical kind of journalism, intellect, sort of intellectual culture, which says, Japanese better than everyone else. We're better than everyone else. There is already one step in the direction of a kind of more than elitism, more than patriotism, 
proper militarisation and fascism. So, so for Stella Sandford, the point of this critical examination of the comparative literature on Heidegger is not to expose a misreading of Heidegger. It is to reveal what is at stake in the mobilisation of the imaginary geopolitical and geophilosophical unities of the East and the West in relation to Heidegger's political philosophical thinking of the West. Soon as we imagine, we have to do this to communicate. We have to talk about different cultures and different languages and different... We, ha we can go East and West, we can go Global North, Global South. But we have to kind of go right. That those are like provisional stakeholders. There, we've got placeholders rather. Um, they're not unities. It's more complicated than that. There is difference, but it's not an absolute difference. There are complicated connections and interactions all the time. So, what is comparison anyway? What what does it mean to do comparative literature or comparative philosophy or comparative cultural studies? There is more to the comparative literature than the mere noting of congruence, congruencies. Studies in comparative philosophy, as in comparative religion, literature, anthropology and so on, are always in part ideological enterprises. Now that's a hell of a claim, but we'll come back to this in different ways, I think. To compare something, and she actually writes quite a complicated uh, section on what the comparison is. If you compare this with this, there's always an implicit basis of the comparison, an invisible third term, like the scales that you can't see, that enables you to do that. What is that? What is That's the interesting question. What is the basis of comparing these things in these ways? The interest in Heidegger um, in relation to what is known as the history of Western metaphysics. Now, metaphysics is a term that means lots of different things. Um, here is a meme that explains that metaphysics is the branch of philosophy that deals with the first principles of things, including abstract concepts such as being, knowing, substance, cause, identity, time, space. So, in philosophy, they have a lot of debates about these things, like what time is, what space is, what exists, what doesn't, and so on, what causality is. And Heidegger, in his... Heidegger tried to over... he used to use words like overcome Western metaphysics, because um, Western metaphysics was bound to concepts of identity. There is one thing, there is another thing, there is another thing, and each thing is just one thing. Each thing is an identity. And if we look at things like, it's stuff that you just know now, because you, you're in the third year of these sorts of courses, you know that my identity, if I say my identity, and no matter how much I say identity, id entity, the entity of the thing, the, the singularity of the thing, I know that my identity is not sing, sing, singular. My identity is an incredibly complex construct of histories and influences and identifications, disidentifications, right? So we know that identity is not unitary. We know that. And the identity of a thing is not unitary. You know, an artwork or a signifier. Draw a swastika somewhere. Oh my God, Nazis. Put it on the outside of a temple in, in East Asia. It's just, like, it's just a Buddhist symbol, isn't it? Right? It's more complicated than that. There's not just one identity to the swastika that the Nazis thought was really cool and they adopted it as their image. Um, so, the overcoming of Western metaphysics, Heidegger's was to talk about ways, ways, paths, to talk about clearings, and it all sounds often a little bit Taoist, so people like Reinhard may have gone, wow, there's this sort of similarity. The way to escape Western metaphysics, Western philosophy, is to turn east, and you would. There was a time when you would see articles written and book chapters written that, like, there was a, a, an article called um, "Modern China and the Postmodern West," which argued explicitly, it was by someone I think called David Hall, that argued that if you look at Chinese philosophy, it's the appropriate philosophy for postmodern capitalism. So, like, it's our Postmodern. The postmodern West is finally catching up 
with the modern and pre-modern East was the argument. So we already have an Orientalist structure going on here. But the interesting thing about the history of that article is that it was it was gathered into a book called something like it was some kind of anthology on philosophy. And I got the first edition of it, and, thought, Ooh. and then later on I went back to look again and they, they cut it out of the next editions because they were like, actually, it's a bit embarrassing now when we've actually stopped to think about that because it's it's Orientalist and it's a it's a weak argument. But people at time have gone, ooh, that's a bit like that. So I wonder if um, this is a stage that, that, that has been gone through quite commonly across um, people's lives, across disciplines, across the 20th century. So the question of what is metaphysics is the, is the Western question, and it's a question of being, of time, of identity, of place. And in a book like this, which I recommend, this is the, this is the translation that I most like of the Tao Te Ching, or the Tao Te Chang, or however you want to pronounce it, Tao Te Ching, if you wish, but it's something close to the Tao. Chinese pronounce it different to Japanese. How would a Chinese person pronounce this book? Tao Te Ching, okay. Right? Something like that. We, something like that. Right? This is a fabulous book. It's beautiful, and I think that it tries to follow the kind of Walter Benjamin logic of translation in which it, it kind of tries to capture the poetry of the, and, and this kind of feeling of the language. There are, there are millions. Apparently, this book is reputedly one of the, if not the most translated book in the world, and that is because no one can agree what it's about. You can read it as a you can read it as a religious text, a spiritual text, as a management kind of like how do you manage a population type of a text. You can read it as pop psychology, you can read the fact that it's so difficult to pin down a signified like what does that mean? Calls out for translation. So this is aligned with what Jack Derrida um, talks about with translation. Derrida argues that Derrida, so Jacques Derrida, deconstruction, he says things like translation is impossible but that very impossibility is what generates more translation. So you might look at that and, you know, maybe I'm an expert in Chinese language and Chinese history and I've read the, the original characters and I've read the and I've gone, okay. And then I read this translation and go, yeah, I could do better than that. I think I want to capture something else. So you bring your own subjective position into it. And that's the nature of any reading. That's why Roland Barthes and people like that were always like, reading is just rewriting. It's just writing. You're constructing an interpretation. So Heidegger's thought was going in this direction, and you have the postmodernists and post-Marxists all kind of going in this direction, explicitly or, or implicitly. Um, and people would often... This was really interesting to me. So a few years ago, I say a few years ago, long time ago, broke my ankle, right? Broke my ankle, couldn't walk. I dislocated my foot, I broke my ankle, I was just bedridden. I bored out of my skull. So I decided, I was like, actually, I, the, rationale, the, the rationale went like this. It's like, in, my, in the before times, I would spend probably two hours a day doing Chinese martial arts. I can't do that at the moment. I think I learned Chinese. So I, uh, on the, I, I downloaded loads of courses and I was really surprised that what you, what, all I knew before that was like Heidegger, stuff written about Chinese, and they said things like, the problem with Western philosophy is that all of its problems are organized linguistically. European, the European verb to be which we, you know, all the European languages have got one, some have got two. <laughs> Greedy Spanish, we'll have two verbs to be, right? Um, that are slightly different from each other. Um, they said that in Chinese, the verb to be doesn't, there isn't one, or they're, they're, it's not, it doesn't have that big deal of status. So, like, um, but on my first lesson, I was like, there is a bloody verb to be. It's true, right? Like, <laughs> Right, right? Yeah. Like, like, ni shi zhong guo ren ma, right? And I said, ha shi ying guo ren, right? Yes. And you go, yeah, 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 that's right. obvious, that's obvious. <laughs> and, and there's not a shi, right? And it's like, um, 
So they're like zhu shu shenma. That's what is that? Ta zhu shu zhu shu shu, right? And then these lines tell you, but shu, it's the verb to be. So this is very frustrating now because learning this, I'm like, hang on a minute, there is a bloody verb to be in Chinese. But all this stuff that I'd read about about the different European languages place the verb to be. The argument is this. In European languages, the verb to be is so central and it's like a lodestone that anchors everything. And you kind of, you ask questions like, what is that? What is? And that's a hugely, apparently, according to people who know more about this than me, the thing that's kind of been like the gravitational pull of European philosophy, whereas it hasn't been the gravitational pull of East Asian philosophy. So... Escaping from this question, reframing this, stopping thinking about being, has been a part of Western philosophy in the 20th century, moving more to ideas of flow and transition and constant change, ways of change, like the I Ching is the book of changes, change, change, everything changes, yin and yang, one thing flips to the other, with a, with a right? Okay, so Heidegger and the Overland. The same thing that from the traditional Western philosoph philosophical perspective writes China out of the history of philosophy assures its entry into that same history from the equ equally but differently Western Heideggerian perspective of the overcoming of Western metaphysics. The stru this structure of internality besets the comparative literature. That is, it's alleged East-West dialogue conducted from the point of view and according to the preoccupations of the West, here, the overcoming of Western metaphysics, is primarily a dialogue of the West with itself. So, Stella Sanford argues that China, in this example, but East Asian non-European thought, has been called not philosophy, because of a, the drawing of a differential, the drawing of a line between, this is philosophy, that's not. And so it's written out of philosophy. That can't be philosophy because it doesn't, it's not preoccupied in, this, in the European manner with these questions. And then the overcoming of that involves going, hang on a minute, how come in Chinese thinking they don't seem to have these same problems? Which is arguably one reason why things like Buddhism and Taoism became increasingly fashionable, intellectually fashionable through the, the, the 20th century. And this is the really tricky bit. It doesn't change the fact that this type of thinking, me thinking this now, can still be regarded as entirely internal to a Western conversation. Heidegger isn't actually having a conversation with a Japanese guest. This is like his internal monologue, duologue, dialogue, right? The structure of internality. Blah, 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 blah. Both the Japanese and the Inquirer are played by Heidegger. Thus Heidegger's dialogue is only a dialogue in the sense that that word names a particular genre of writing. It is preoccupied with the issue of the possibility or impossibility of an East-West dialogue. The alleged affinity is between Heidegger's philosophy and Western rendering, Western renderings of East Asian thought, which once again are really a dialogue of the West with itself, having discovered its own categories in the thought of another tradition. Western philosophy and Asian thought, the latter internally subdivided into the imaginary unities of East Asian and Indian thought, are themselves Western categories. So we've got, actually this is some, some really complicated levels of stuff going on here. Because on the one hand, she's saying these binaries are... How do I explain this? These are Heidegger's binaries. They're Europe's binaries. But they're also... They do also open the door for real, for real like, etymological, linguistic and cultural... But there's a, there's a, so Heidegger's kind of right. This Western rethinking of itself, imagining the East, is nonetheless sowing the possible seeds of a critique of Western thinking, right? <laughs>
And this is essentially what Ray Chow argues about Jacques Derrida. So Jacques Derrida, as we will, uh, oh, we won't have time to do, but we might if I do it really fast. She actually says Derrida does the same thing. Heidegger doesn't do this. He doesn't do this because Heidegger is deeply invested in the idea of Europe, European thinking. Like Heidegger was a kind of a linguistic sort of uh, xenophobe. He thought that you could only really do philosophy in German or Greek. All the other languages were just inadequate to the job, is what he genuinely thought. German and Greek, everything else you can't do philosophy in. Um, but Derrida, who thinks in the same sort of structures, is very interested in critiquing Europe and, and be doing more that kind of a, what became post-colonial studies where you might not necessarily know anything about the other, but you do know there is difference, which means that you know that the Western tradition is a construct and can be different and can be changed, can be challenged rather than sort of fetishized. So Heidegger makes an articulation of the category of the West central to his philosophical concerns. These aspects of Heidegger's work must be among the most embarrassing paragraphs for his uh, sympathetic readers, second only but intimately related to his enthusiasm for German National Socialism. In this bizarre, arbitrary linguistic nationalism, it's impossible not to see a relationship between Heidegger's conception of Western philosophy and his politics. So Heidegger's... Not, not wrong, it's this thing, like except there's a baby in, in the bath, and you want to throw out the bathwater because you want to see, well, what's the, what's the real gem here? What is the real value in Heidegger's thinking? There is some value in it, but he maintains these unities and goes, there's the West, Germany, and there's the East, China and the rest, and never the twain shall meet. Like Heidegger just says, no, it's not going to happen. Can't do it. Can't do it. Which means, Heidegger's saying... I can't understand you and you can't understand me, so we might as well not even really bother, because we're different. Um, which is something we can think about the ramifications of that maybe in our seminars. Um, maybe not. So on the one hand, he's not doing the right thing with thinking about cultural difference, cultural translation. What does it mean to say that I understand a concept, I understand iki? Right? What does it mean to say that? If I'm not if I'm not steeped in a in a Japanese culture, and then the the final piece of reading is um, is Ray Chow. I, I'm not going to let us have a break. Sorry, mean today because I want to I want to get to there's some good stuff at the end. Of it. Um, so Ray Chow, the chapter I want you to read um, the chapter the bit definitely the bit on stereotypes. After that. So it's chapter two, Brushes with the Other as Face, Stereotyping and Cross-Ethnic Representation. The first section on stereotypes is very interesting. And Chow is writing ultimately about um, actual, actual encounters, the kinds of things that Heidegger would just maybe dismiss as um, inauthentic. And she refers to the work of Frederick Jameson, who you might um, know of as the boot person who theorised postmodernism. Frederick Jameson has unambiguously and unapologetically affirmed the inevitability of stereotypes as something fundamental to the representation of one group by another. The relationship, this is a quote from Frederick Jameson, this is quoted by Chow. The relationship between groups is, so to speak, unnatural. It's the chance external contact between entities which have only an interior and no exterior or external surface, save in this special circumstance in which it is precisely the outer edge of the group that, all the while remaining unrepresentable, brushes against that of the other. Speaking crudely then, we would have to say that the relationship between groups must always be one of struggle and violence. So Heidegger's position is, is that we, we exist in our cultural bubbles and our encounters with anything outside of that bubble must always be kind of mediated by something that is reductive, of the other is reduced. We don't stereotype the people that we know best and that we interact with because we just know them. But as soon as there's an awareness of a shared cultural difference, 
It's what you notice that becomes the stereotype. That might be an accent. It might be a language. It might be a taste for certain sorts of food. It might be the music. It might be skin colour. It might be hair. It might be height. It might be anything. Could be anything. But that you kind of go, oh. And then you, you can't perceive your own cultural boundaries, but you, they, they be, I have to hide these images of spheres here. And also because Peter Slotnadijk, who I'll talk about next week, uses the image of spheres. We don't notice that we're in these, like, hamster balls or whatever, running round. <laughs> and it's only when we bump into other people, we stereotype them, because that's just what happens, right? So she writes, that this is, a, again, Jameson quoted in the first section of the, of the thing. Group loathing mobilizes the classic syndromes of purity and danger and acts out of a kind of defense of the boundaries of the primary group against this threat perceived to be inherent in the other's very existence. Modern racism is one of the most elaborated forms of such group loathing, inflected in the direction of a whole political program. It should lead us on to some reflection of the role of the stereotype in all such group or cultural relations, which can virtually, by definition, not do without the stereotypical. For the group, as such, is necessarily an imaginary entity, again these terms, imaginary unities, imaginary entities, in the sense in which no individual mind is able to intuit it concretely. The group must be abstracted or fantasized on the basis of discrete individual contacts and experiences which can never be generalized in anything but abusive fashion. The relations between groups are always stereotypical insofar as they must always involve collective abstractions of the other group, no matter how sanitized, no matter how liberally censored and imbued with respect. The liberal solution to this dilemma, and we talked about this in some of the seminars last week, Doing away with the stereotype or pretending they don't exist is not possible, although fortunately we carry on as though it were for most of the time. So Chow is playing around with Jameson's thinking and Jameson's saying that as soon as you have a sense of identity, or you, maybe you even construct your sense of identity as a group by virtue of an encounter with another entity perceived as another group, and you immediately reduce them conceptually, as a handle to, to grasp, as, a, as a, a way of identifying, as a way of exploring. So, this is Chow um, clarifying. So there, look, I've got, we're holding this bubble, this whole other cultural bubble in our hands. Like we can say, you know, now we can go, you know, all Chinese are, uh, all the Germans are, you know. We know this much about Heidegger, we know this much about Germany, therefore all Germans, right? We could do that. Um, and that's just, that's, she's saying that's just the way it works, right? In other words, the understanding of stereotypes that Jameson has so succinctly delineated, namely that it is a matter of the outer edge of one group brushing against that of another, that it is an encounter between surfaces rather than interiors, cannot really be foreclosed again by the liberalist suggestion that everyone is entitled to her own stereotypes of herself, which others should simply adopt for general use. Once the inevitability of stereotypes, now clarified as relations conducted around exteriors, is understood, the liberalist solution along the lines of cultural entitlement can no longer be a solution. So stereotypes aren't going to go away and we can't just ask people what stereotypes we would they would prefer of themselves. So what do we do? I mean, what, what is the, the solution? Chow's approach is she goes, this is quite interesting, she talks about the original coinage of the term stereotype and it comes from printing, the printing process. And it was only later that it got its, its kind of essentially negative um, connotations. Stereotype is something necessary for reproducing. So, and that's arguably the way language works anyway. You, you have a term for, for uh, a general term for things that are really singular or, or, or unique in their own ways. 
So Chow is interested in this fact about stereotypes, this history, and she challenges us to not stereotype stereotypes. Because if a stereotype is bad, we've stereotyped it, right? We're engaging in stereotypical thinking by thinking that stereotypes are necessarily bad. Because, you know, in terms of our own, the, the common thinking that we should have positive stereotypes, positive role models, positive images, positive, 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 and we don't want anything racist or orientalist or sexist or anything like that. We've already acknowledged that there's different sorts of stereotypes. When we want to see positive images of X or Y group. As the politically correct go about attacking stereotypes, what is usually repressed is a paradox in the very act of criticising stereotyping, namely that in order to criticise stereotypes, one must somehow resort to stereotypical attitudes and presumptions. For instance, in order to repudiate a certain attitude as racist stereotyping, one would, to begin with, need to have already formed certain attitudes towards that attitude, to have stereotyped it or marked it as, a uniform, as uniformly possessing a distinguishing set of traits. In other words, any charge that others are stereotyping inevitably involves, whether or not one is conscious of it, one's own participation in the same activity. Ray Chow, Ray Chow one of the reasons I really like reading Ray Chow is because she, she's good at this. She's really good at pointing out this sort of stuff. Like, she, she writes... Um, there's a, a great um, essay that she wrote called The Fascist Longings in Our Midst, and she talks about going to these really kind of liberal, politically correct like conferences in America in the 90s. And anyone who says anything out of line about multicultural, about cultural difference, like anything that doesn't toe the line about cultural difference would be called a fascist. And she says that's essentially the structure of fascism, not being able to genuinely say anything different. So she'll notice that the celebration of difference has to be done in certain very prescribed ways. And you can't celebrate difference differently. You have to fit in. And she talks about the way these kind of power dynamics build up. So you get these paradoxes where even in a context or a, or a group or, or an interaction of groups that's meant to be open to difference becomes incredibly close to it paradoxically. So, uh, in Muriel Rosello's words, there is a stereotype of the stereotype. The stereotype is always bad, simplistic, idiotic. When attacked as a unit of truth, it takes its revenge by forcing speaking into an act of mimesis. So, we're rethinking stereotypes at this stage, okay? Um, and Chow says that the, the real interesting thing about stereotypes is not simply that they are mechanically reductive, but that they're also creative. Stereotype can be incredibly inventive, so they capture sort of two dimensions of language at once, two dimensions of representation. You have to have the recognisable repeated mechanically. Like, you know, a, a, you know, there's an infinite array of leaves out there in the world, right? But we have the word leaf in English, and that means any leaf. So we're simplifying, right? And this is an example I'm getting from Nietzsche, right? It's a violence of language, reductive simplification. The word leaf, or leaves, uh, it's, it collapses massive diversity into it. That's what language does. I've stereotyped leaves there. They're all just leaves. All the same, these bloody leaves, right? Goddamn leaves, too many of them, right? On the line, on the road, get blocking drains. Leaves. So, um, on the one hand, mechanical reproduction, stereotyping them as a problem, or leaves in this case as a problem, but it's also a stereotype is incredibly creative, so this is the most artistic and ingenious part of language. And this is how all language works, perhaps. So the potential and hence danger of stereotypes is that they are able to conflate these two realms of representational truisms, the conventional and the formulaic on the one hand, and the creative and the original originating on the other, when for obvious reasons of propriety they ought to be kept separate. So, stereotypes are used politically, 
We know this. We've seen this. We see this all the time. I mean, one of the, the recent, hopefully recent past, you know, great users of stereotypes was Trump. To, to demonize specific ethnic groups and specific demographics. And it was just often just lazy, thoughtless racism, xenophobia and so on. But it had this effect on the world. This is why, and this is why it's a problem. Here, Chow lists lots of different ways that, we, that we've seen stereotypes being mobilized for political or ideological purposes. So this is a World War II stereotype. That's a, that's a hideous caricature of an evil Japanese aggressor. And obviously, who needs to be protected? Women and children, because very patriarchal. So come on, men, join the army. Again, another, I think I googled, like, you know, yellow peril stereotype or something like that and come, came up with images like these. So, Racial st this is Chow again. Racial stereotypes are typically deployed as a way to project onto another all the things that are supposedly alien. In the light of an idealized group identity to be guarded in its purity, such stereotypes of unwelcome others are indeed demons, bad figures to be exercised. Stereotypes are capable of engendering realities that do not exist. But stereotyping is far more tricky than hitherto thought. Because the perception or awareness of stereotypes, that is, at those times when we ha happen critically to notice such representations, may itself already be following a certain stereotypical pattern. Maybe we only notice some stereotypes sometimes, but we're actually constantly immersed in them, constantly surrounded by them, constantly using them. But at certain times, a discourse becomes politicised along certain lines and we notice our representations or, or stereotyping another group and we can't notice all of them all of the time maybe maybe it's impossible to to get that purity that we really want where we're purely good and we've got a halo and we're great and when maybe that's just impossible maybe but nonetheless something to be kind of sought and then um, the child writes about, um, so this is after the stereotype section, just read the stereotype section, think about the points raised in it. But basically she's got a long section on Derrida and grammatology and deconstruction. Uh, Derrida's book of grammatology, it's just like a really rubbish title. Um, it, it never became grammatology, people start talking about deconstruction instead. I think when Derrida wrote it, he intended people to use the word grammatology for what he did with his analysis of stuff, but people start to talk about um, de deconstruction instead of grammatology. So, Chow writes about Derrida, cross-ethnic representation is not just a matter of discovering more and newer routes to, to and contact with other cultures, whether by means associated with Christopher Columbus or Bill Gates. Instead, it is a process in which the acceleration and intensification of contacts brought by technology and commerce equal an acceleration and intensification of stereotypes. Stereotypes that, rather than simply being false or incorrect, and hence dismissible, have the potential of effecting changes in entire intellectual climates. The implication here is the world is intensifying, internet, transnationalization, globalization, and that means we have these in intensified encounters with the other. And one of the effects of this is the intensification and expansion of stereotypes, which will change, and they'll have the capacity to change structures of raci racism or prejudice. Um, so this is a point that I often make. Stuart Hall, who was uh, big figure in cultural studies. He said, when, if you're going to do cultural studies, don't look at a text and go, that's racist, it's bad. That's not racist, it's good. That's sexist, it's bad. That's not sexist, it's good. You look at the way a, a cultural context is racialized at a certain time. Or the way that gender politics are being actualized at certain times, like the way that Feminism and sexism, for instance, 
are being played out. And then new discourses emerge or come to the mainstream, like we're seeing around trans, and then massive convolutions and, and twisting around of positions and changes. These debates don't stay the same. They actually move faster and faster. And, and, you know, the, the, the concept of something going viral, boom, it's around the world. You know, polarised uh, and, and, and violently exploding in different ways. These climates are changing all the time, organised by stereotypes. So I'll, I'm going to skip over Chow's own examples, which are um, actually um, all rather good. She writes about Larry Fane, who was a, a, um, a cartoon writer, cartoon drawer in the 80s and 90s. <coughs> And it was all based in Hong Kong, and her argument is, if you look at Hong Kong, it's, all, it's already being stereotyped by the West and by China, both of the, the this is so pre-1997. And her own uh, argument is that, is that Larry Fane really plays with these, with these stereotypes and like um, shows the, the inevitability of it. So my favorite one, of all of them, actually, is this one. So um, she writes a lot about about this this particular um, cartoon. So Ying Man, this will be in Cantonese. Um, English wants the living language of Shakespeare now being bludgeoned to death by Japanese garment manufacturers. And you've got two stereotypes here. This is a stereotype. This is a stereotype. Both looking at each other in kind of incredulity. So this is. On the, like so, you know, there's this is nonsensical, meaningless, Chinesey sort of character here, and then some nonsensical, meaningless English there, and they're both kind of playing the same game. They're they're, they're both wearing the cool other culture's T-shirt, and both looking at each other with incredulity. So not meeting, not in interacting, but actually both kind of being. I guess globalized, so maybe this is a sort of a Heideggerian picture here of what's happening to to these different sets of cultures. Maybe this is the kind of thing Heidegger's talking about. As much as I can really dislike the Heidegger, it nonetheless offers an interesting way to think about this sort of scenario. Is this a meeting? Two people walking down pre-1997 Hong Kong street, looking at each other, going, what the, what the, what is that? Unintelligible stuff. But that's a difference that's been produced by what? We can easily say capitalism then. Japanese garment manufacturers. Nowadays, garments aren't manufactured by Japanese. Yes? Um, just like what you said about capitalism, like, isn't that like also like a very big part of like how culture gets like eroded the way that you said? This, yeah, this is kind of the image of that, I suppose. Like in relation to your earlier question. Yeah. So like... This is quite a, this is quite a new trend. This is you know to be able to just buy, consume. I'm going to say consume in a very casual sense. Consume the shit. Like, it's just shit. It's just stuff. It's just it's it's just it's just consumption. It's meaningless commodities. And lots of people get very offended by these things. So there's a on the one hand there's a kind of snobby dynamic to it, where you know. A friend, a friend of mine would scoff when he would... There was a fashion a few years ago for people to wear, like, Che Guevara T-shirts. And it used to really wind him up because he'd read a couple of books about Che Guevara. So he, like, knew the truth of Che Guevara. And people would just wear... And I had a Che Guevara T-shirt because I'm really fashionable. And <laughs> I used to be young. Che Guevara T-shirt with some Spanish stuff on about me being a communist. Um, which uh, I didn't... You know, Anyway, I suppose it's all right for you to have one, because you've read a bit of Marxism. But there's that, there's that. But then there's also the more kind of like, so you go to, like you're in Australia or New Zealand, and you go to some kind of Aboriginal historical landmark, and then you go to the gift shop, and you buy a tea towel, which has got like mystic religious symbols on it. That's, maybe we're not allowed to have the religious symbols on a fucking tea towel, right? So there's, there are so many different dimensions to this. You know, maybe that is, really is an abuse. It's not just cultural appropriation to put, um, you know, to, to have a, a tea towel with religious symbols on it from another culture. That's because it's not stealing someone else's tea towel. It's abusing someone else's 
every, yeah, everything about that. So, we can think about the dynamics of that. We've got, oh, let's do, so five minutes. I mean, look, look read, skip through Chow's chapter and look at these examples. They're very interesting. Um, and I've done a quick sum up, but I'd rather you just maybe read that uh, later. I want to do one clip to finish with. I've actually, uh, we'll watch the other ones maybe in the seminars. So, have we seen the, have we seen Goodness Gracious Me? It was a, the first real kind of um, uh, Indian Asian television comedy show in Britain in around 2002. It really was. And it was called Goodness Gracious Me, which was essentially uh, a reference to uh, a, an old Peter Sellers song. Goodness Gracious Me, the comedian Peter Sellers, who would often, in the 60s and 70s, kind of, you know, brown skin up and play Indian characters and pull on the character stereotypical actors. Let's just watch this one. We've only got five minutes. This one is, I hope the volume is up. So, um, there's a lot going on in that. Um, there's a lot of kind of stereotypical reversals, playing with stereotypes, um, I mean, the the, caric the, the, the self-caricaturing though as well as playing on the, there's so many different dynamics to that, but the point of the, I guess the point of, of this would be the, the kind of, the relational status of stereotypes, and also their kind of implicit changeability, there's, you could do a lot with, so goodness gracious me, was a British show starring and written by British Asians who were often playing caricatures of and were often ridiculing the older generation, their parent generation but nonetheless, so therefore you can say this is an internal Western conversation with itself but it's not because there's no simple unity that is Englishness or Britishness and, and it, this, this sets up this comedy this satire, it does so many different, so many different techniques involved in it that it kind of recasts all manner of different stereotypes and, and possibly changes, possibly changes the stereotypical climate. If we always live in a stereotypical typical climate, then it kind of changes them. I think it's quarter past now, so I won't show you the other clips now, and I won't um, sum up. But but hopefully um, we we'll look at some more examples tomorrow in the seminars. Thank you, well done for um, attending in this terrible weather. See you later. <laughs>